that if you think of the, about the kind of face recognition and other technologies that they have avidly scooped up from our universities and paid for the research in them, for example, and you consider that anywhere, any kind of work of that sort is being done around the world, there is also going to be Chinese money and probably Chinese researchers there as well. And you multiply that by the last decade of nonsense there's been at Western universities allowing that to happen without working out that it might not be in, in the national or indeed in the global interest, it's hardly surprising that those capabilities exist. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. Is China the most powerful nation on earth? Xi Jinping has been accused of being the most authoritarian Chinese dictator since Mao, and China's economic strength continues to grow. To discuss what a Chinese superpower might look like, I'm joined by Matthew Henderson, a former diplomat based in China. Will this century be the Chinese century? Can you describe what a Chinese superpower would look like? It's very hard to do that because at the moment what we are seeing is China becoming a superpower because one person is trying to achieve that. Whether he will succeed, whether he has the materials needful or the will or the strategic thought capacity, uh, it is very, very difficult to say. The aspiration is massive. The challenge is enormous. And it's far from clear that that construction of the huge economic power, the huge population, the huge production capability, the huge growing military force under that particular leadership, whether it really has the capacity to achieve its ambitions. That is the ch biggest challenge that we face strategically at the moment. What will they do to get what they want to get? And what will the effect of that be on the rest of us? For decades, Western politicians have had this idea that by increasing trade with China, that by increasing cooperation with China, they will become more democratic and more open is that idea now dead in the water? I suspect it always was. It was simply that it's taken us a long time to wake up to that fact. As soon as the Chinese saw the traditional uh, communist bloc collapsing, as soon as they saw the forces that were rallying against communism, they decided to prevent that from happening. First of all, by issuing their famous document number nine, which said, we will not allow the outside world to do peaceful evolution, as they called it, that means the process of change that you've just described, we will not let that happen. Little by little, that defensive stance has turned into an aggressive one, whereas they're now taking the fight to what they absolutely clearly perceive as an enemy, which is the free world order. And they are saying we will now subvert them and change them in the way that they were thinking to subvert and change us. So by trading with China, we're basically, and cooperating with China in many ways, we're playing into their hands. And how do they view that uh, organization or that relationship? Do they view it as a zero-sum game? Yes, precisely so. So you join up with the WTO and that's a great breakthrough because suddenly you appear to be accepted at the table of international commerce and proceed to, <laughs> to corrupt the WTO in such a way that it no longer has any of the necessary effects. Uh, it, they did it quite cleverly. This was not as an outright declaration of war. It was a decision to infiltrate, exploit and use. We've seen the same thing happening with the World Health Organization, we're seeing it happening in all sorts of other areas at the moment, but by joining and subverting, well, the IOC is another one, the Olympic, the Olympic Committee, we'll maybe talk about that later. Yeah, so first of all, uh, build up your strength, then get in and exert your leverage, and then the club that you're meant to be joining, see, it becomes a club that you can actually run the rules on. And that's going their way at the moment, it would appear. During the Cold War, there was this idea of two superpowers rubbing up against each other. And in the 1990s, when the Soviet Union fell, many predicted the end of history where America would be dominant. Are we now living in an era where there are competing systems that we have democracies in the West, we have India, which is sort of a pseudo democracy, it has its own format, we have China, we have Russia, and there's not going to be one uh, dominant power in the century to come? That may well be very true in geographical terms, and it does appear that that's rather the way that China sees it. China sees, as we were saying, a zero sum where there are places which are either part of China or in some way subject to China, where the uh, trade that they do is essentially with China and where the dwindling so-called Western world is, is something that is outside that camp. Um, so yes, there is, that is a, a new projection of a globalized binary system. The problem is that we're now so interconnected with Chinese interests and Chinese capacities that even those of us, like we, us in Britain, who 
cle clearly hope to remain out with it, actually have already <laughs> sold our <laughs> semiconductor capacity to that China. So to what extent we really are any more geographically or economically or politically or militarily separate is really up for grabs, it seems to me. I suppose I was also <laughs> referring to this idea that it is inevitable countries are going to become democracies and specifically Western style democracies. And as we mentioned earlier, with China, that hasn't worked. But there's this idea that, you know, the West and America in particular can go around and build nations and convert countries to their system. But now we may be living in an era where countries simply live within their own existing systems and they compete against each other. Do you think there's anything uh, accurate about that? I think that model is a good one where you had an America that was trying to do that, but increasingly we're seeing that they're fighting shy of it. Uh, they don't feel that it's an appropriate use of their resources. Their resources are limited anyway. Uh, they've had their fingers burnt in a number of fairly spectacular ways in recent years, and Afghanistan is only the latest. However, I think there is an alternative approach to all of this would work much better, which is rather than the rest of us rely on uh, the Americans to sort things out for us and, and keep the, uh, the forces of entropy under control, that we all recognize that we have as independent nations with independent national interests so very much in common that it makes much more sense as it were to become once again a sort of united nations if you like united by that sense of the importance of free trade worldwide of uh, democracy as you rightly say and uh, of certain standards and rules the so-called rules-based international order but that is something that could be very much alive and I think with recent developments in the Indo-Pacific uh, and other developments, even post-Brexit, we can see that there is a possibility of reviving a world where Britain can be a global Britain uh, with partners. And that is a world which is capable of standing up against these totalitarian authoritarian systems, which see at the moment very little in the way of order and stability in our camp, uh, which want to, as it were, in the case of China, host the Olympics to prove once again, the superiority of the Chinese development model, which is exactly what made them want to host the 2008 Games. Um, but in fact, um, we're doing the opposite. We're saying, you are part of the main. You are not an island of a different way of doing. Because actually, we are your clients. We are the people who can provide assistance where necessary. And we can work together, but not in this binary manner. So it's not so much about rival superpowers as really a very profoundly different attitude to what international relations are about. The PRC, or rather the Chinese Communist Party, really does not have allies and friends at all. They've got people that they fear and people that they wish to subject or have already done so. The idea of partnership and multilateral diplomacy is entirely alien to and unpopular with the Chinese Communist Party, despite all their talk at Davos in years gone by of win-win solutions. The underlying text was, you will be under our control if this happens, hence the Belt and Road Initiative. Now we can see that that model has failed. It is basically overextended. It is uh, still used in a very, very transactional manner to strip out resources and sell products and generally try to move Chinese economic difficulties to really to outsource them, put them out, as it were, debt is being exported and control is coming in. But that's not at all the same as the rules-based order where people are trading nations who interact and, and get diverse sorting, uh, sourcing chains organized between them and run things according to a shared consensus about what international law is about. The Chinese approach is entirely different. Now, you mentioned the Olympics there a couple of times. Next year, China is going to be hosting the, the 2022 Winter Olympic Games. Should Britain and other Western countries boycott those games? This is a question that's been going round and round and round since China felt strong enough in the 90s, the late 90s, to put in serious bids for well, if effectively what turned out to be 2008. That was an entirely political act. Um, being given the chance to host the games was akin to what I said earlier, being allowed to join the, or invited to join the WTO. It was seen as an indication that the international order as currently consti constituted was willing to accept China in as a member of that club, despite all the ways in which it never really would be one. So that was Jiang Zemin in charge at the time. And he was absolutely clear about this. He, he, he said, this is us finally being able to take our place, our deserved place at this highly symbolic uh, construct, which is essentially a Western one. 
But by doing so, we're showing to them that our, our way of doing is working and may well be better. That is exactly the motivation this year, 13 years on. Once again, it's a question of prestige. It's a question of proof of concept. But above all, it's post-COVID. Look who came out on top. Would any of you have been able to host anything like this? I don't think so. Look at Tokyo and what a muddle that was. So essentially, it's a challenge to the world order that we've been talking about and not joining up with the Olympic ideal. There are no chariots of fire rumbling around the streets of Beijing. I can tell you that. Would a boycott have any impact on the regime? Xi Jinping was in charge of the, of the Beijing end of the 200, 2008 bit. He takes it very personally seriously. He is absolutely dead set on getting this. And if there were a serious prospect that it wasn't going to work out in some sort of way, that would undoubtedly exert very great pressure on him as China's leader. He has thrown himself and his henchmen absolutely behind this, as I say, as an existential matter of proof of party uh, competence. To that extent, one could say there would be a kind of leverage. But when you don't know what the effect of exerting it would be, it is very, very dangerous. So I can say, yes, it would have an effect. But what that effect would be, given the other issues that one would want to lump in in the discussion, which is obviously Taiwan, first and foremost, there are two completely different dialogues, it would seem. On the one hand, you've got China saying, we are a great and successful economy. We can host an amazing games. This will be a truly um, drug-free, proper and splendid and uniquely wonderful uh, reprise of our amazing 2008 performance. And meanwhile, just off the coast of China, you've got 23 million people being threatened with obliteration because they're not accepting becoming part of that so-called one China. These two dialogues are about the same thing. Let us not mistake the similarities between them and the importance of them to that one central vision of what China under Xi Jinping wishes to achieve. They are one and the same. So any approach that you have to China hosting the games or the PRC hosting the games has to be the same approach that you apply to your response to their threats against democracy in Taiwan. You can't distinguish these two things. The Chinese side have been absolutely brilliant at playing on our continual Western bien pensant wish to separate political from military, to influence, to all the other parts of ec to ec not from economics, all the other parts of what makes a functioning world. Because gov Western governments tend to have separate ministries, separate ideologies, the Treasury is saying this and the foreign ministry is saying that. The, the CCP doesn't run its rule like that. It's a single narrative. Every single part of that narrative is interconnected and fighting for the victory of the CCP over everybody else. So unless we're talking that talk and thinking that thought when it comes to considering the Olympic issue and the Taiwanese issue and the Tibetan the human rights, the Xinjiang issues and all the other very fraught issues that China's pitchforked the world into, then we will be divided and conquered and we'll simply say, oh, that's all right, then it's just the Olympic Games. Never mind, we'll move on not down our road. We're going to get on to Taiwan at the end of the interview. For now, though, let's talk about Xi Jinping. You mentioned him there again. He's one of the most important people in China. Uh, you can't understand China without understanding Xi Jinping. Can you give viewers an idea of who this man is, his history and what he believes? Xi Jinping is the first top leader of China to be born after the establishment of the People's Republic of China. He is therefore not one of the old generation who made it, like Deng Xiaoping and Mao himself. He is its product. He is a princeling. His father was a very senior cadre. His father fell foul of Mao during the Cultural Revolution and was exiled to the provinces. Xi Jinping himself experienced the horrors of being uh, rusticated, sent to, 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 to a village. He actually ran away from the village that he was sent to. Later, he tries to join the Communist Party 10 times and isn't accepted, probably because he's blotted his copybook. He has been there and done that and seen how bad it is. He is somebody who's been hardened in the fires of chaos. He understands the system that he now rules and he knows what the risks are to him. So he's a very different kind of creature. He has adopted the mantle of Mao. He, uh, a few years back, he got himself officially called the Renmin Ying, uh, sorry, Ling Xiu, the, the helmsman, as it used to be translated, of the people. 
uh, which effectively puts him on a level with Ma. But now it's gone beyond that. He is somebody who is defined as being, his, his ideology now is the embodiment of Chinese culture, an extraordinary statement when you consider what it would actually mean if he were the embodiment of Chinese culture. Uh, I don't think Chinese culture would ever have done any of the things that he's doing in Xinjiang at all. And yet he's prepared to take that position. Let us in what? The culture is me. You know, what is that? It is quite extraordinary. That is unprecedented and very dangerous. Now, the last time they had a leader like that, which was Mao, look what happened then. So who is Xi Jinping? Xi Jinping is somebody who knows what the risks are. He knows how he has to just hang in there. He's Putinized himself. He's given himself control of the military forever, control of the party forever, whether or not he calls himself president forever frankly doesn't matter. He's going to be doing this thing. And whereas when he started in around 2012 to 13, he was talking about economic reform, opening up, freeing the, the, the state from the private sector, making sure that the state-owned enterprises would bank down. That entire reform program was launched at that stage collapsed. I remember quite a senior Chinese official saying to me, we woke up at that time and realized that we were facing stagnation and collapse of our economy and the social order as, as acute as it was back in the late 70s, when at the end of the Cultural Revolution, all of the havoc that had been there, what on earth were we going to do next? And this person said to me, if any one plank of Xi Jinping's first big tranche of economic reforms fails, they're all connected like dominoes and a whole lot will go down. Well, one by one, those dominoes have fallen over. Debt mounted, SOEs were not got rid of properly. Um, the economy didn't diversify itself. Then, of course, there were external difficulties in the relation to the Americas and it made it better. Belt and Road was, I think, launched as a way of trying to deal with that, to seize an initiative and, as I said earlier, move some risk overseas. Well, par partly as a result of COVID and partly as a result of the fact that so many countries have been brutalized, so many environments destroyed and so many other Western interests threatened by it. It's been seen that BRI was really rather a mixed blessing, to put it very, very mildly. And the, the money's rather run out as well. It was never earning the money that it was intended to. And then COVID put a stop to a lot of those earnings. So we've got Xi Jinping in really rather a strange position. He doesn't really understand economics. He understands a binary system where there are well, we call them systemic competitors, and that's probably a very polite way of doing it. But there are, there are states and structures and institutions which he sees as inimical and which need to be replaced and pushed out of space and economic power and any other form of domination, whether it's over law of the sea or the law over the Antarctic or whatever. That has to be eroded in order that this China construct, the thing that he's brought through those fires, Tiananmen Square, past, it's never going to be repeated. We will not allow the West to do anything to us at all. We won't even give the WHO any of the results of what we were doing in laboratories and all that, despite the fact that we're signatories to the international regulations on this sort of matter. It's a one-sided story now. Whatever suits China is what I'm going to do, and we'll see where it takes us. That's Xi Jinping. Whether or not his, uh, well, his henchmen have to put up with it, whether or not there are sufficient senior people who can see a world perhaps without him being a slightly safer place, I don't know. I mean, the name Jinping it means approximating peace. Well, there's not much peace being approximated by Xi Jinping at the moment. I just want to take a step back, uh, if we can, in terms of Xi Jinping. People might assume, if they aren't as well versed in Chinese history as you are, that after Chairman Mao, every single Chinese leader has been a firm, authoritarian, powerful dictator. Is that the case? I mean, is Xi different from his predecessors? And if so, how? Well, what he has done is having seen that the sheer scale of an expanding economy like China inevitably led to the emergence of regional powers. We saw Bo Xilai in the southwest becoming even a threat to him by having a, a fiefdom, as it were, in Sichuan. We've seen him realizing that the army had slipped a little bit out of party control and had acquired huge over wieldy bulkiness and was hugely economically potent, but not necessarily very effective. We've seen the security apparatus being transformed by him, and we've seen purges of corruption as a means of doing various things, but undoubtedly removing a lot of corruption. Um, so from that point of view, he's, he has in a relatively short time put a personal imprint on many, many of the structures and institutions of the Chinese state and of the Communist Party itself. Um, to a degree, as I say, making himself the ultimate decision maker, maker on almost everything. You know, there are these things called leading uh, small groups, um, which um, have actually become 
many think tanks set aside from the ministry. You find that the ministries are much less powerful than they used to be, and these things are where a lot of the, the shots are called. So Xi Jinping himself would have been in charge of a committee about the Olympic campaign, for example, about things like um, cyber and national security and so on. He set up a national security commission, which he's obviously keeping a very close eye on. And so the centralization of institutional power not just into the Standing Committee of the Politburo, but to him personally, is something quite extraordinary and unprecedented. Is there now a cult of Xi Jinping forming within China? How do the Chinese people view him? Two very good questions. At one stage earlier on, when he was doing all this motherhood and apple pie and dove stuff, uh, he was very happy, I think, to be seen as Xi Dada, Uncle Xi, and or Daddy Xi, however you want to translate it. So paternalistic and friendly figure. But then this hard man, this pragmatist, this realist, saw that that could actually be a vulnerability. It's too personal. The, the, the party apparatus and the thing that he runs is something he wants to be invisible, not Chairman Mao, the great star rising in the, the sun rising in the east, because the sun can set if it rises and everybody's hooking their hopes on it. He now is something very much distinct from all that. He didn't appear in Wuhan until things had gone pretty far down the road. He wanted to stand back from it all. And although he's there as a, as a symbol of all of this, and as I said, he's hailed as the symbol, if you like, of, of Chinese culture, there is a, a sort of reticence about being a, too much of a personality, if you like, one of these North Korean dictators. He doesn't do that. He's not a, a publicist and a, a popularist in any way whatsoever. So there is no real cult. It's just something that people have to recognize is the wind that blows and align themselves with that wind. It's not personal. And nobody, he, you know, what's that, that, that Roman tag about, <laughs> as long as they fear me, I don't care if they hate me. I don't think it matters what the Chinese people think about him. I mean, obviously, when the poor uh, tennis player uh, gave her story about having been um, uh, abused for many years, in fact, by a senior uh, Chinese leader, uh, that is something that is an affront, not to Xi Jinping, though there are reasons why it might be a very strong personal affront, but to the nation, it's all about hurting the feelings of the Chinese people. But the Chinese people are something that's manipulated by the party. It's not a, a separate entity that can like a leader or not like a leader. It doesn't matter if they don't like the leader at all. What on earth could they do about it? So no, the cult's not there. There's a thing that's there, but it's not a cult. Now, if you were advising Joe Biden or Boris Johnson, and they had a meeting with Xi Jinping, for example, how would you advise them to deal with him? How should the West deal with him as a person? That is a profoundly interesting and important question. But it begs another question, is, which is how would you know? When you go and talk to even the most senior Chinese leaders, you may come away, as people have done, and I think it was particularly true of Deng, who was extremely charismatic, with a sense of a human contact, some kind of rapport, something that would enable you to manage difficulties and com make compromises, perhaps behind the scenes, on a personal basis. We see that formula. We've seen pictures of poor Tedros from the uh, World Health Organization being shaken by the hat, but it could have been any other part of him that she didn't choose to grip. <laughs> but it wasn't a two-way process in any way whatsoever. This is not a mode of governance. This is not an individual, as I was saying earlier, that is susceptible to that sort of um, rather Reaganite approach to interactions. No, you had a, a good meeting. He didn't choose to drum his fingers on the table or sort of <laughs> shuffle his shoes, and you stagger out again. And well, what have you? What could you possibly have achieved? One understands that there are these discussions that sometimes they're quite long. That people talk about this and that before some other big meeting takes place. Well, good, thank goodness that happens. But the difficulty really is that I'm I'm not sure that anyone, anyone at all, other perhaps than Mr. Xi Jinping himself, knows really what his risk-gain equation looks like. And therefore, it's, I would say, incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult, except at a geostrategic level, to work out how you, you might deal with this etat c'est moi issue around an autocracy, which is so big and whose tentacles extend so far around your own neck. How successful has he been in crushing dissent against himself personally within China. How strong is his position? Does he face any vulnerabilities as a leader, as a dictator? It depends where that opposition might be uh, a found. Now, the level of granularity is absolutely astonishing. When a senior official recently published 
on the internet as part of an article, I think it was, a piece of poetry which could be read as a suggestion that a hubristic leader would soon become ashes in the wind. Not only was that text obliterated, but so was the fortune of the man that wrote it. Now, in no way was saying that a threat at all to Xi Jinping, but the fact that it even happened was unacceptable. Now, that was the sort of visible end. But that same level of granularity extended right from the word go when an American magazine published what was probably quite a credible account of his net worth. That sequence of figures, if you happen to type it in anywhere in China within minutes of it being published in America, would have your computer closed down instantly. So, and that was a while ago. So with the immense power of, of uh, AI that's been harnessed by the Chinese security apparatus, and the wish obviously of all the people who maintain that control not to be caught napping, effectively from the big brother point of view, we're looking at something that you and I probably can't even imagine in terms of its, as I say, granularity and its capacity having locked onto you as a troublemaker to change your life without you knowing it for the rest of your life and probably your children's lives as well. This is this topic to a degree that it is very, very hard for us to understand. But if you think of the, about the kind of face recognition and other technologies that they have avidly scooped up from our universities and paid for the research into, for example, and you consider that anywhere, any kind of work of that sort being done around the world, there is also going to be Chinese money and probably Chinese researchers there as well. And you multiply that by the last decade of nonsense there's been at Western universities allowing that to happen without working out that it might not be in, in the national or indeed in the global interest. It's hardly surprising that those capabilities exist. So you talked about opposition. Now, I know nothing whatever about the power that there might be in a big Communist Party leadership, obviously disparate with long and complex uh, connections in different parts of the country where she perhaps was not so powerful. It does appear that his immediate group of henchmen are people that he grew up, if, if you like, with in uh, the eastern provincial coastal uh, areas. Um, and that there obviously were other parts of China which didn't have that same level of exposure to him. But um, they may well feel that this is not looking good, that actually there's an awful lot of risk around and the gains that they're getting are fairly uh, specific to Xi and his, and his intentions. But whether that constitutes opposition and whether uh, it's fully coate in any way at all, I don't know, but I doubt it. Frankly. You hear different thoughts on this. Matter. We've talked about Xi's weaknesses. Can you now give us a rundown relatively briefly of China's weaknesses as a country, and we can talk about the economy, we can talk about geopolitics, where are they vulnerable? China's external relations and its external policies are almost all driven by very specific domestic circumstances. So let's look at what those are. They are running out of water, they're running out of workforce, they're running out of the environment, and they are really running out of the capacity to do the thing, that, when I'm talking about the Communist Party, not, not China as a, as a group of people, to deliver that growth, to deliver that stability, that sense of ease and predictability uh, for the future, which has been, if you like, the nearest to a social contract you get within a dictatorship. That is a weakness on a massive scale. And it's a weakness which goes beyond China's borders. It has an enormous impact and stress it, it stress tests everything they do internationally. And those stresses are by no means all under control. They're overextended, I think. They're over-reliant on the passivity, hence all this use of AI to keep people under control, the passivity of a massive number of people over a massive amount of extremely damaged territory. And you look at their problems with demographics, they started up banning everybody from having more than one child, and that created a horrible problem now that will be the whole them really forever. They're gonna have by, I suppose, 2050 or so, they're gonna have um, two non-working people for every worker. And their social services just can't support that, anything near that. And it's gonna get worse because not only does the attempt now to have first two children, which started in 2015, and I think this year you're allowed to have three, but nobody can afford them, and people are now infertile to such an extent. I'm not exaggerating. Fertility is falling for the most amazing number of reasons, all coming together. Meanwhile, you've got all those old folk who are living longer, 
life expectancy has gone up. So you've got a dwindling new increment and you've got this older, huge age and iller and expensive to keep them going population. This is in itself one of the biggest problems. Now, if those people are literally not reproducing properly because the air is so bad that male and other bodily issues are beginning to affect that picture, not to speak of the fact that there is this dis disconnection between the number of men there and women there are, it's something between three and 4%. And when you multiply that by the scale of the Chinese population, what sounds relatively minor is in fact massively problematic. You're looking at prospects of social instability, to put it very mildly, purely on grounds of what it's like to be a person in China. That is not uh, a bleak picture and an excessively hawkish view. Those are all hard facts that the Chinese side recognizes very clearly indeed. China may be the first country to grow old before it grows rich. And I think you just alluded to that there. What does that mean for the West? I mean, is China going to become more uh, aggressive, more hawkish as they see this issue of their demography uh, as such a long term crippling problem? You, 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 you've tacked aggression to demographic issues. Um, aggression is sometimes used by totalitarian regimes as a way of distracting from their own incompetence. So, yes, in that sort of narrower locus, quite possibly. It's been traditional throughout the, the time that the PRC has existed that the past is used to demonize people outside, the Japanese very often, but also the, the colonial oppressors of 19th century. Really, any, anything that you can do to say it's the bad guys out there that have caused our trouble has been done. It's almost been done too much. And it got to the point, in fact, a few years back, that stirring up uh, uh, resentment against Japan was actually stirring up resentment against the Communist Party because it was resentment that was being stirred up and it wasn't particularly focused. So provincial governors who allowed that sort of thing to run a little bit riot, you know, you've got a bit of a bushfire breaking out, they were told to crack down jolly quickly in case it started spreading. So aggression as a means of distracting, particularly when you've got a huge country with a, such a big border, you know, you can beat up on the Indians and you can beat up on um, people in... Uh, in Taiwan, and you can do what they do in various other theatres. And that looks all right. But as I said earlier, there's a lot of stress out there. And that aggression as a distraction is expensive as well. Um, running uh, adventurism and lots of big naval power and so on is incredibly costly, even though they've stolen lots of technologies that make it a lot cheaper and a lot more dangerous from us, sadly. Um, but all of that involves, again, as I say, risk gain abounds, abounds and a lot of treasure to maintain your credibility. Because if you decide that you're going to present yourself as a contramundum and you're defending China from this, all this external pressure, you jolly well better be good at it and succeed uh, and, and have something that will achieve its purpose. But none of that's been tested in anger and some of it might well not work. Let's hope they never try. One of the Communist Party's great successes as they see it is the huge growth in China's economy in recent decades. Hundreds of millions of people have been brought out of poverty. In the West, there's this idea that China's economy is almost invincible and that it's in a hugely strong growing position. Can you talk about, and you mentioned this earlier, some of the weaknesses in China's economy? It may not be as strong as they claim. We're talking about the debt crisis, weaker growth, inflation. Can you go into why their economy may not be as strong as they claim? Simply because there is no really good economic model. They're trying to run what Jiang Zemin used to call it a Western style approach to the economy, without it being a Western style approach to the economy. They don't have a diversified economy because they don't have a market economy. They've tried to have one, but it isn't one because you can't actually do your own thing. If you're successful as a, as a as multimillionaire, as people have found who thought themselves completely invulnerable, you've just got to say something a little bit off about what the party's up to, and that's the end of you which inclines other people to be a bit more cautious. The trouble with having this ability to get rich and, and then that's glorious, but actually don't expect to be able to do what you want or do mergers and acquisitions in a freehanded kind of manner or maintain your patents, because in fact, you are simply tools of a totalitarian non free economy. That is extraordinarily difficult to make any sense of, even some little, well, it wouldn't work in a place like Singapore, let alone across such a wide and so globally connected structure as the Chinese economy. And of course, it is still a relatively poor country in terms of per capita GDP. The economy is extremely polarized. It's very localized. 
uh, there are all sorts of stresses that result from that. And that's one of the reasons that BRI was really designed not to be simply a, a pitch for global <laughs> globalization of China. It was actually encouraging relatively impoverished border regions to be better connected to some of these uh, pipelines of wealth in and out. And to a degree that might have worked if it wasn't the way it was done in Xinjiang, that was one of the biggest ways in and out that's now gone really rather wrong. So a very uneven economy, an economy, as we were saying, that's dependent on labor force that's simply fading away, at least in terms of relatively unskilled labor. The huge weight of the state-owned sector retained simply because it's too dangerous to disemploy all those people and make those structures effectively redundant. Um, as I said, that economic program failed at the start of all of this. And then a lot of the solutions were effectively slightly risky and ones that hadn't worked. The banking sector, the stock market, all of these things look like something with a Western name on. But everybody can see perfectly clearly that the Chinese stock market doesn't work like a stock market at all, nor indeed do banks, which are really just some sort of funny ways of, of laundering money in and out of the government. So there, there, it looks like something that's sophisticated. There are infinitely complex legal structures and ways that you have to do this and that. But they're not about an underlying system where there are proper ways of doing that are accepted as conventional and then ways of managing the, uh, the exceptions to that. Because the exceptions to that are basically very often what the party itself suddenly does. It turns around and just gets rid of a multimillionaire here. Does funny things to the tech industry. You know, makes it an environment for investment including FDI, which is alien and peculiar and worrying, but also to some of China's brightest on, and most entrepreneurial minds. This is the problem with this Communist Party thing. It just doesn't know what it's trying to achieve and it doesn't know how to achieve it. Many in Britain would say that, uh, particularly businesses, there's nothing wrong with trading with China. They make us uh, just as prosperous as we make them. And if you look at the regime, yes, there are issues in Xinjiang and there are issues in Tibet, but they're hardly the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. These are people who are adapting to the free market global economy. And it does us all a favor by trading with them and making us all richer. But none of that trading really happens, at least not on a grand scale. The, the Chinese market isn't open. It simply is not open. Uh, you can't simply go and get an equal relationship and equal protection of IP and all of those other things. So when a big Western enterprise invests in China, as many of them have done, they're basically saying there's a lost leader here. As long as we can manage to sell something into that Chinese market that we are making and that they're going to pay for, that'll be good. But we know full well that even as we do so, we are having our IP stolen, we are having our products counterfeited, we're having our product uh, uh, methodologies adopted, uh, we may ourselves indeed have invested in R&D facilities inside China. All of those are being drained. So little by little, we are actually a cash cow of ideas, which once they've been replicated, will be used to compete with us. Now, some companies with a short-term vision are quite willing to run with that. And they say, OK, we'll hang in there for this, for this particular product line or this technology for two or three years during which we'll make some money and then it'll all be gone. But that's what happens anyway in a, in a digitalized world. And so they may be all right with but in terms of the way in which outside markets and the market inside China have been able to interact, it is absolutely not the picture that you just described. To what extent is the West penetrated by Chinese influence, by Chinese spies, whether we look at the media, uh, politics or in business? Vested interests in the West, for the reasons we've just been describing, very often welcome the blandishments of an extremely wealthy an extremely directed partner, particularly where that partner is essentially a state actor. Um, the, the pressure that can be brought to bear by that state actor on individuals who are about to retire from one type of employment and possibly looking for something else, or people who are opening up a company and hope to have access to such an enormous market, uh, just as with things even, I'm afraid, like the IOC or the WHO, there are ways in which you can weaponize money to achieve very, very rapidly successful results, such that you can basically tick X number of boxes and say, yes, that's our man or our woman in, whatever government or company it might be. That process has been being pursued for many decades, and it's been actively facilitated by people who knew what they were doing, by people who suspected what they were doing, and people who frankly didn't care what they were doing or had no idea that it was going on. So that combination of ignorance, naivety, optimism, uh, willing, uh, 
corruption, frankly, there's not to too fine a point on it. That combination has enabled the achievement of a level of integration, not just spying. It's not just a question of a few people doing um, sneaky tradecraft. You don't need to. This is done in open sight. And you've got, you know, as I was saying earlier, quite a lot of faculty in some of our most valuable R&D uh, universities and elsewhere who are happily purloining, pocketing and replicating all of that. And we're getting grants from it and careers are built on that and professorships are opened and named and 10 cent this and goodness knows what that cropping up all over our most august establishments. That is there. It's a given. The problem is what on earth do you do about it? Because somebody said to me once, yes, you can see the trunk and you can see the tail, but that elephant is holding up the roof. <laughs> what are you going to do to scoop it out? Very difficult, but it's there. Yeah, definitely. Find somewhere that isn't a novice prize because it just means you're not spotted it. One of the great threats to world peace, according to some experts, is this threat towards Taiwan. Now, you mentioned this earlier. What is the likelihood of China invading Taiwan in the next decade? I don't think that, and we won't call it China, that the Chinese Communist Party or even Xi Jinping would like, no, likes the wrong word, sees invading Taiwan as a successful idea. Why would it be? You know, if the real point is not just your personal prestige, not just the idea of being the person who was in the driving seat when the, the so-called reunification took place, therefore you go down the history as that great um, unifier and a wonderful thing for somebody like Xi Jinping to aspire to. But a lot of this is about, well, first and foremost, geoeconomics, <clears throat> where are all these uh, chips made, basically, and would a pile of smoking rubble make up for the loss of the source, the current source of most of the world's, frankly, best semiconductors. So that's not looking good. If during a decade you can steal their technology, uh, buy all that inventory, I mean, Huawei has huge amounts of <laughs> piled up chip, but of course the ones that really are gonna make a difference in the world, in the internet of things and sort of G15 as opposed to five, or uh, there will be those uh, technologies and the places where they're made, which effectively is Taiwan and South Korea and anything that the Chinese have managed to steal and bits that have been outsourced to America. So very unstable situation in that regard, and that's Taiwan. So that's really important not to smash that up too much. But the point is, I think, to wait 10 years during which you steal and develop and build such a powerful capability to blockade or constrain or control in other ways, Taiwan without having to invade, that willy-nilly de facto you get a Hong Kong scenario but run rather better, where it simply has become part of the PRC, not one China or something of that nature, but because the West has just lost it, which they hope they're achieving, and it is looking a little bit like that in some ways today. And so the invasion idea is something that you project as being risky, potentially lethal, and if you've got the sorts of military capabilities that seem to be being developed there now, people will be thinking very hard about whether gunboat or aircraft carrier diplomacy is going to have any effect at all, other than floating a very large target slap in the face of a hypersonic missile. So but do they want to invade? No. Would they invade? Good question. Hope not. But we've got to think about what the effect would be of them not having to, and effectively saying we can Take one of your bits of democracy, free world, open market, rules-based, law and order, free speech, the whole thing, and we can just get it. So you think that China could de facto invade um, or, or sort of consume Taiwan without a shot even being fired? That would be the preferred outcome, and it wouldn't express itself or happen in quite such a simplistic manner. I think what one would see would be a falling away of support for the idea of a free and independent Taiwan. Now, at the moment, we're hearing some most unlikely voices, especially the European ones, and good luck to them, saying that we are with you, you know, Taiwan is a center of democracy, and we are standing with you. What is Europe standing with you in a military context like? I'm really not too sure. And we've got the Lithuanians doing their marvelous thing. I mean, this is really splendid, but bear in mind that the big fuss in about the Lithuanians that the Chinese PRC is making now is that they have a Taiwan representative office. Well, there's one of those in Victoria. So, you know, we've got to just sort of think about what it all means. So what does it mean? It means that we do, it would seem, as that world order that I was talking about, that aspirational world of, of freedom and democracy, we're looking at 
24, 23, 24 million people and quite a lot of them voters and most of those voters for, if not independence, certainly the status quo. We're looking at the maintaining of that status quo being something existential from our point as well. This is not a Chinese fight with uh, Chinese expatriates. There's nothing of the sort. This is a, a really, uh, really serious challenge. The whole idea of a free and open navigation, trade, but most of all, I think, rules-based anything at the geostrategic level. So that is a, is a big, big policy challenge for the West. And strategic ambiguity and all these other ideas about we accept a one China policy, but we also have a meaningful and rather constrained, but nonetheless robust relationship with whatever you want to call Taiwan. But it, how can you call that a one China policy in the current circumstances? Well, you're doing that because it's a, it's a Beijing idea and it's acceptable to Beijing because as long as they can say, oh, country X, Britain, whoever it may be, America, they're all saying they believe in the one China concept. But that one China idea, that model under Xi Jinping, surely doesn't fit the facts anymore. And I wonder whether or not we're not allowing that label of one China to become something that changes us simply by the act of, of continuing to accept its intellectual tolerability. It seems to me it's, it's lost all of that. How can we believe in one China when we've seen what's happened in Hong Kong and what's happening in Taiwan? What is this one China? Do we want to be part of it? Does Taiwan have the capability to defend itself if China does make that decision to militarily invade? Defense is a funny thing these days when you've got cyber coming in and all sorts. What I would say is that Taiwan, with the amount of support it's got and will, I hope, continue to get, can make it very difficult for an invasion to succeed and possibly cause the more thoughtful and equable people on the other side to think, would this be a good idea? At the moment, it most assuredly would not. But unfortunately, there are strong indications that they might have put a timeline on that by saying, if we can achieve this, this, and this, and this in terms of build up of capability, we will no longer feel that that risk is against us and that things might, the odds might be for us instead. Not, as I said earlier, of we would win a fight, but people wouldn't dare to pick a fight. Finally, is there anything that we can be hopeful about in terms of China, how should the West be responding to China at the moment? We should respond to China pragmatically, calmly, and rationally. We shouldn't demonize, we shouldn't personalize, we shouldn't make ad hominem attacks on anything. We should simply say, here is an enormous issue with which we are, for all the reasons we've been discussing today, intimately interconnected, where our interests are threatened very largely by a series of highly adverse factors over which severally as independent countries, we have very little control whatsoever. That situation is not as intractable as it might appear, but it will be if we don't unite effectively in whatever forum it might be, whether it's in, in some sort of new caucus of supportive partners in the Indo-Pacific, whether it's in structures like a G10 or something of that sort, whether it's in the Quad or whatever it may be. We need to get that vocabulary working practically in terms of international agreements, alignments, and standard setting bodies which recognize openly and honestly the need to work together with whatever regime is operating in China, but in a way which does not eternally sap, erode, and weaken our own position, which is precisely the way by default that we seem to be working at the moment. It doesn't have to be that way. We can do it, but it requires vision, clarity, courage, and honesty. These qualities, I'm afraid at the moment, are not very much apparent in many of the circles where they should be. Good for the Lithuanians, but Lithuania alone can't do it. Go Lithuania. All right. Thank you so much, Matthew, for joining us. Pleasure.